A strange recurring theme in the UFO phenomenon is water. It's been reported that one in five UFO sightings involve unidentified craft being seen above or under bodies of water. Yeah, a lot of these uh, UFOs have been captured on video, some of them over water. What is that? And because of that, the U.S. Navy, with ships sailing in oceans across the entire world, has become a major source of UFO sightings, with hundreds of reported cases. Today, we're diving deep into murky waters and discussing when a UFO becomes a USO, unidentified submerged object. Welcome to the basement office. Everyone knows the term UFO, unidentified flying object, craft in the sky. USO, un unidentified submerged object, is essentially these craft being observed either coming out of the water, into the water, or traveling through the water. Water seems to play a big role in the common thread of sightings, correct? Absolutely. Water does seem to be critical. And it's interesting that, that, of course, traditionally, we thought that the Air Force had the lead for this subject. And only recently, perhaps, with the ATIP program and the Nimitz encounters, are we learning that the Navy is a big player in all of this. And again, it brings us back to water. Right. And if you remember, the original story that kicked off all of this modern disclosure in the Nimitz story, the pilots describe seeing UFOs, these, you know, 45 foot Tic Tacs flying through the air, but they also saw a USO, the size of a 737 underneath the surface of the water, creating a disturbance on the surface. And one of the UFOs, these little Tic Tacs, was hovering above the USO. One of the new anecdotes to come out of all this recently was uh, David Fravor, Commander David Fravor, who was one of the witnesses of the Tic Tac, uh, was on the Joe Rogan Show. David Fravor tells a story of earlier, pre-Tic Tac days, uh, earlier in his career, a naval ship going to retrieve a disabled torpedo water drone type thing. And as they were approaching uh, this disabled object in the water to retrieve it, a, uh, as he describes it, a dark disc-shaped object emerged from the depths of the ocean. Because it's not a submarine. He's seen submarines before. Once you see a submarine, you, you can't confuse it with something else. And he starts screaming to, through the intercom system to tell him to pull the diver up. And the diver's like a few feet from the water. And all of a sudden, uh, he said the torpedo just got sucked down underwater, and the object just descended back down into the depths, and they never recovered the, the torpedo. Jesus. And when I heard that story, a lot of puzzle pieces started possibly connecting. I looked back and started noticing that, yes, many UFO sightings occur near bodies of water. And one of those puzzle pieces comes from season one, when you and I were discussing these flying saucer photos taken by the Brazilian Navy over the ocean. 1958, the military of Brazil takes these photos of a saucer in the sky. Yes, this is a Navy training ship and multiple witnesses and these extraordinary photos. And it's also interesting that over the years, there have been a number of reports of UFOs emerging from and, and flying back into the ocean. Just as you think you're beginning to get a handle on this phenomenon, there's a new aspect to it. It could be coming from the ocean? Well, that's one of a number of theories about this. Okay, so before we move on to well-documented modern cases of USOs, I think it's important to look back in history human history and realize there's a lot of stories and folklore regarding weird stuff coming out of the water. 
Absolutely. And people say, well, in folklore, in religion, the gods always come from the skies. Not yeah. true. Plenty of gods come from the water. There's Poseidon, there's Enki, the god of the Anunnaki is the water god. Uh, the birth of Venus, she comes out of the ocean. Right. And another thing, in, in doing research for this episode, looking back through history, something that I learned that I had no idea was real, and it turns out it is, is in 1492, on board the Santa Maria, Christopher Columbus, en route to discover America, writes in his logbook describing a luminous hovering object above the ocean, observed by those of his crew. Have you heard of this? Yes, it's an interesting piece of American history that I guess a lot of people haven't heard of, but there it is. As you say, it's in the ship's log. It's on the record. Yeah, and I think it's mostly dismissed because uh, scientists have written it off in, in many ways with natural explanations for what he saw. A meteor, things, a star brightly, you know, a star that he didn't know what he was looking at. But the way he describes it in his logbook is of a candle, a lit candle, hovering above the ocean. And that's weird. <laughs> and then there's an event from Japanese history, folklore, a tall tale, you could say, that does actually have some documented history behind it. It's from the turn of the 19th century, 1803 in Japan. Are you familiar with this? Yes, this is truly bizarre. I mean, it's really surreal. Yeah, the, uh, it's so crazy. The, the legend is called Utsurobun, and it translates to roughly hollow ship, hollow boat, and the story goes that in 1803, this object right here washed ashore on the coast of Japan. Local fishermen see it, they approach it, and a figure emerges. Yes, a female who spoke a language that the local people couldn't understand, who carried with her and refused to be parted from a strange box, a device of some sort. Uh -huh. No one knew who she was, where she came from, what this object was that she had arrived in. So a history museum in Japan has released to the public an exhibit, a book or manuscript from the 1830s that writes about this event. You can see here the, uh, the story is told. There are artistic interpretations of, of what the fishermen claim to have seen, the craft. Here is the figure, the woman that they said they saw, and she's clutching this box. And the story goes that after she was acting weird and she wouldn't let go of the box, uh, the fishermen led her back to the craft, put her inside, and out to sea she went. The whole story is so weird, Nick. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, so the weird drawings, the weird sketches, the weird story, all notwithstanding, I should reiterate that this is regarded as nothing more than folklore. Further investigations have been done by modern historians into this case, and while they haven't been able to prove that nothing like this happened in 1803 Japan, there is no evidence to support that this is anything beyond folklore. But I mean, I think there's, there's a wider issue there. You look at something like this and you say, well, it's just folklore. But what is folklore? I mean, in a sense, it is information passed between people. We do ourselves a disservice if we just dismiss it as, as tales that were told. Okay, so there was a little bit of weird history regarding weird stuff coming in and out of the ocean. But now we're gonna dive into well-documented modern cases of USOs. 1973, Piedmont, Missouri. First sighting comes from a basketball coach and some of the players at night. They see uh, a UFO, a, a diamond kind of spin top shaped UFO. It gets weird when dozens and dozens of people begin to see the object hovering above Clearwater Lake, which was the big lake near Piedmont, or coming 
literally out of Piedmont Lake. A couple pictures were taken. This is the glow. It started with a glow above the horizon to the to the east, and witnesses um, saw within Clearwater Lake a glow, reddish glow, reddish light in the lake, and then an object would emerge from the lake, out of the lake, and become a, some people saw an orb, or as you see in this photo, which was printed in dozens of newspapers, this object, a kind of spin top diamond, maybe even triangle shaped uh, UFO. And all of this takes place near Clearwater Lake. There are some great quotes, by the way, in this case. There's a local police chief says, there's no doubt that there's something up there. We just don't know what it is. And one of the first witnesses uh, basically said, I know this is gonna sound funny, but there's hardly anyone around here who hasn't seen it. I can dismiss one person saying, I saw this thing coming out of the lake, this big object that didn't make a sound, it took off its feet. But when dozens and dozens of people from all areas of a town, a city, a state, begin seeing and describing the same thing, you've gotta sit back. You have to sit back and go, wait a second. What are they looking at? <laughs> you know, what are they seeing? Something's there. So, a well-documented case with a ton of witnesses, sketches, Air Force involvement, takes place in 1965, starting over Oklahoma. A wave of saucers, flying saucers, is seen by hundreds over four states. And on the first day, it was actually at night, July 31st, 1965, it all starts with a USO, a fisherman at night in his boat on a lake. He observes a saucer type object with a greenish white light slowly emerge in front of him out of the lake and then zip off at speed. He was so shocked by this that it's reported he was hospitalized for shock. It, it really just bl literally blew his mind. And it was determined he was not on drugs, not drunk, and was an upstanding citizen. And then you have four or five straight days of multiple sightings of multiple saucers spreading over Kansas, Texas, Oklahoma, and the like. And you can see here the headlines of how the news of the day was covering it. Thousands more see flying saucers Oklahoma, over Oklahoma City. Here's a sketch by a witness. And, and that's pretty detailed. There's, yes. there's not much middle ground with something like that. Yes, this is uh, would be the object that a fisherman claims came out of a lake and then took off into the skies and was then seen in the skies by locals over four states. Now, the interesting thing is the Air Force gets involved. And what, what do we know now in, in, in 1965, what was the Air Force doing at this point? Well, of course, we had Project Blue Book. So they were officially investigating these sightings. The Air Force was coming out, interviewing the witnesses, and very often, sad to say, what they were trying to do with these waves of sighting is debunk them. Right, yeah. They would try to downplay people's fears downplay oh you didn't see this what you actually saw was was this and observers witnesses were actually starting to argue with the Air Force because the Air Force was reporting no as it says here no you were just seeing a star or Jupiter come on I mean do they take people for idiots People look in the night sky all the time. I know what a star and planet looks like, and, and I bet the guy who was out fishing knows darned well, too. But what's funny is evidence, further evidence, shows this. These totally not UFOs, per the Air Force, totally Jupiter or a star, per the Air Force, are tracked on radar. They were tracked at altitudes of six to 9,000 feet. Not millions and millions of miles away as in Jupiter. Or any star, right? <laughs> so something was six to 9,000 
feet in the air. Uh, so, I, you know, as you can see, I, I don't want to dive deeper into Oklahoma, which was made international news, but it blew me away that the, uh, the catalyst for this wave was indeed a USO and one that uh, scared a, a hardy fish, local fisherman almost literally to death. So in this case, we're able to read about the Air Force's involvement. And when you look at the Air Force's Project Blue Book files, you see at least 623 cases of USOs reported by the US Navy. So within Project Blue Book, these 623 cases, I've pulled some selects where Blue Book coordinated with the US Navy in order to investigate the sightings. And I'd like to just bring up a few examples here. August 1950, naval officers aboard a ship see an unidentified elliptical object approach the ship. The speed of the object was estimated to be around 500 miles an hour. The object was described as ovular, egg-shaped, tic-tac shaped. The object's color was described as shiny aluminum color, sparkled in the sunlight, and also as metallic white. The official Project Blue Book conclusion of this, unidentified. August 1954, off the coast of the Yaranjima Island in the Pacific Ocean, witnesses aboard the SS Dr. Angier witness a 100-foot diameter disc approach the ship from the northeast. It was estimated to be 100 feet accurately because it literally flew over the ship, stopped, and then rose and disappeared into the sky. The witnesses were interviewed by U.S. Air Force Intelligence, Project Blue Book, in the final conclusion, unidentified. So you've got the U.S. Navy seeing these crazy things, coordinating with Project Blue Book, the government's official UFO program, to investigate what they saw, because they don't know. <laughs> they don't, if, if they know, it wouldn't have been a report. And it turns out official guidelines, Navy guidelines were issued. So basically here it is. Here's the whole procedure of if you see this, report it this way. And I love this because it's got at the top, of course, you know, picture of missiles, picture of a ship, picture of a submarine, then picture of a UFO with a military aircraft as if, yeah, that's every bit as real as the other things here. They drew a flying saucer <laughs> and they're telling pilots and, and Navy men, if you see this, here's how you report it. How to send it and then to send that communication of that report, of that sighting to a specific destination. One has to wonder, if you were someone at, at one of those destinations receiving these reports, what kind of reports were you getting? What was that like? We spoke to someone who used to be in the Navy who worked at one of these destinations and received a message. Let's cut to that Skype. When did you join the Navy and how long were you in the Navy? I joined back in uh, February of 1968. I was in there for four years. Served in Vietnam in combat action, had a high-level, top-secret, uh, Crypto Level 14 security clearance. Mostly worked at the uh, Naval Communication Station in San Francisco, which was the busiest military hub back then in 1969. So all communication from all naval ships is kind of coming into where you are? Yes, on the Pacific side, yeah. On the Atlantic, there's other, but it was much more traffic on the Pacific side. There was a code room when atmospheric conditions are really bad. Uh, the only thing that can make it through is primitive communication. It's much slower, you know, Morse code, you know, do 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 do, you know, type of thing. I was a certified high speed code operator, 25 words per minute. I was monitoring nine ship to shore circuits simultaneously for traffic from the ships. And I took thousands of messages during the years that I worked there. And uh, the one message that came in always left an uh, imprint you know, in the back of my memory. What, which was what? 
A ship that was reporting its position off the coast of Alaska said that the uh, crew visually witnessed coming off of Port Bow a brightly glowing reddish-orange uh, elliptical unidentified object about 70 feet in diameter that merged out of the ocean, shot straight up into space. Uh, the ship's radar operator tracked the blips going over 7,000 miles per hour. Uh, this was a uh, secret uh, classification priority level going to the Chief of Naval Operations in Washington, D.C. What kind of call was it? Was it a distress call? Was it just a, hey, this happened call? What kind of communication was coming from this vessel? It was a classified secret message that uh, was coming in, you know, through Morse code. I was typing it out on the typewriter as I'm typing this message out and decoding it in my mind. I'm reading this thing. I can't believe what I'm reading <laughs> Yes, I'm, I'm decoding it. I almost thought for a second, oh, I could go over the Xerox machine and make a copy, but then, you know, you get 10 years in prison, that doesn't work. So, you know, handed it on to the communications watch officer, which then took it to the uh, crypto and then sent it on to Washington. Okay, so after this 1969 experience that you had, did you have any other run-ins, experiences? Did you hear tales of other cases after that? I've done a lot of research since that time. I find out that's not unusual. There's actually thousands of USO reports that are coming out of the ocean that date way back. And that brings us to the big one, probably the most famous USO case ever. Shag Harbor, Nova Scotia, Canada. Why don't you give me the basics? Sure. October 4th, 1967, multiple witnesses see essentially an unidentified submerged object. Something comes down, enters the water. Uh, subsequently, some people say they see it floating on the surface. The military is involved. Uh, many, many witnesses. Right. And leading up to this story, before this object that people see uh, collide with the harbor off Nova Scotia, there are a few sightings uh, leading up to that. One is an airline pilot who uh, captured the object on radar. He said it was rectangular shaped with uh, a string of lights. We've got a family at the same time sitting on their front porch. This is around seven or eight at night. They look up, they see the same exact object as this airline pilot. You've also got down in the water, you've got a boat captain picking up the object on his radar. He saw four objects on his radar, four different objects. So while the it, uh, some folks saw one solid object, a rectangle, others were picking up perhaps different objects. So this sucker is seen, four lights, descending at speed towards the harbor collides with the harbor people say they hear it sound like a bomb going off yes a sort of whistling whooshing noise as this object or objects descends at this point uh many people were calling their local radio stations to report i just saw this the first person to call Thor to see this with his own eyes and to call authorities that first phone call was by Lori wickens who we spoke to via skype Let's listen to his story. You were a witness at the Shag Harbor event. Yes, I was the first one to call the RCMP that night. There was five of us in the car. We see lights in the sky. We just thought it was an airplane. And describe for me what you saw. There was four lights. They were in a row in a line, all level. And after we went a mile or so, as we made a corner and started going up a hill, the light went from going level to a 45 degree angle. And before we made the top of the hill, the light went out of sight for about three seconds. We made the top of the hill, there was one light in the water. We just thought it was a plane that went down. We went to a phone booth and called the RCMP to Royal Canadian Mounted Police and reported a plane crash. One theory is that this is a crash, but I wonder, when, when you come to think that there was a recovery operation, they went 
They searched, expecting to find debris. I mean, people thought initially, one of the theories was, this is a plane crash. They didn't find anything, and that's interesting. It raises the possibility that this was a controlled descent into the water. And indeed, if some, some of the witnesses saw it floating on the surface, did it actually take off and leave? What do you think it was? Don't know. They said something crashed. They say we officially search for something, but we don't know what it is. And the official story says we found nothing. Nothing was found. And to me, that's almost as crazy as we found a UFO because if an object is observed in the air, tracked on radar, its size estimated, it's seen crashing into a harbor, and if gravity works the way it's supposed to work, you would find something in that lake if it indeed was a crash. You would think there would be something down there, or if this really was a crash, as the witnesses believe, debris. We have no proof that the official story, we found nothing, is false beyond logic. And I think logic says if a massive screaming object falls from the sky and hits a lake, you're gonna find something. You're Like you said, debris. I mean, I'm fine with accepting that it's a balloon or X, Y, Z, but to say nothing was found after, quote, it sounded like a bomb going off when it hit is just preposterous in my opinion. Is that something that the military has a history of doing though? Well, I think you can look back at the entire history of military involvement in this and say, at the very least, they've downplayed it. I mean, if this was something conventional, the police report would simply have said, a pilot saw something, uh, there was an apparent crash, we searched, and sure enough, sadly, uh, a light aircraft has crashed, and we've recovered it. And that's all the report would say. And of course, we see from time to time, that's exactly the sort of report you do read. In, in government files. But this, it's something else. Now, if you remember, at, as we started talking about Shag Harbor, we talked about the, the sightings in the, in the radar data before the crash. One of those was a boat captain who you know captured the objects on his radar. Here is an official report with the Royal Canadian Mounted Police about, as you see here, the unidentified flying object on 4 October 1967, in which that boat captain is interviewed. He acknowledges within this document, at times the Navy do a lot of practicing in the area. He acknowledges, look, the, I know the military and the Navy, they've done tests, there's testing grounds nearby, I know stuff happens out here, but he says, Quote, I had never seen anything like this before. When an object left the water, it went straight up in the air with only one red light. And so he, he sees this sucker go in the water, remain in the water, move through the water, and then take off out of the water. Could have been this, could have been this, but I literally had never seen anything like this before. And, you know, many of us haven't. I mean, to see something crash into the ocean, move around, and then take off again is preposterous. It's difficult to reconcile that with something that we had at the time. I mean, you know, these these people are pretty good witnesses. I, what I like about this is he's very careful not to be, I, I suppose, over embellishing this. Yeah, yeah. He, he says, like when he doesn't know, he says, I don't know, or I couldn't see it. Right. So you, you are getting a real straight shooter here, just telling it like it is. And yeah, absolutely. When you think, well, could it be this? Could it be that? No, he sees that kind of stuff. And on top of that, at the bottom of this report by the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, it says, Captain Mercy is considered to be a reliable type individual and bears a good reputation in his community. The officials, the police, military found this man to be legit. So most of my brain leans towards Occam's razor. This is all just simply experimental aircraft created by humans that still to this day is being withheld from public view. But it's hard to process at the same time the data, the evidence, the witness accounts by law enforcement, military, 
all describing something seemingly impossible. And as we covered in the last episode, now astrophysicists and US Navy personnel say perhaps even something not human.